Is the United Nations living up to its founding principles? We recently marked the 75th anniversary of the world body, which was created as stated in the UN Charter in order to promote international peace and security, to protect fundamental human rights, and to guarantee equal treatment to all nations, large and small. And so today is a fitting time for us to ask, is the world body standing up for the victims of human rights violations who most need help and holding their oppressors to account? And when it comes to Israel, are UN bodies upholding their obligation to act without discrimination? We're very honored to have our distinguished keynote speaker, Ambassador Gilad Erdan, who currently serves in the dual role as Israel's ambassador to the United States and the United Nations, who will be joining us from New York to address these questions and I'll be introducing him in a moment. I'm also delighted that our legal advisor, Dina Rovner, will be here to launch the UN Watch database, a state-of-the-art website that provides vital information and tools to hold the UN to account. Finally, we'll have a Q&A with journalists, academics, fellow activists, and other prominent guests. Ladies and gentlemen, we meet now on another anniversary. 15 years ago this week, in a historic vote, the United Nations adopted Resolution 60-251, which abolished the Commission on Human Rights, a body that had named Colonel Gaddafi's Libya as its chair and which had become so discredited that even UN Secretary General Kofi Annan said it was, and I quote, casting a shadow on the reputation of the UN as a whole. In its place, they created the Human Rights Council under the promise that the new and improved version would, and I quote, address gross and systematic violations of human rights and ensure universality, objectivity, non-selectivity, and the elimination of double standards. As a case study for the organization as a whole, I'd like to take a brief look at what is the UN's highest human rights body. 15 years after the old discredited commission was replaced with the new and improved Human Rights Council, where do we stand? Has the UN kept its promise? Let's take a look. In the current 46th session, there is one agenda item on the entire world for 193 countries, which was debated last week, and then a separate agenda item, a debate that is actually taking place today, which targets one country alone, Israel. No other UN member state is singled out. There is no agenda item on Iran, which massacres its own people for protesting. No agenda item on Russia, which poisons dissidents. No agenda item on Cuba, which throws artists into prison. And no agenda item on China, which herded one million Uyghur Muslims into camps, persecutes Christians, disappeared courageous men and women who sounded the alarm on the coronavirus and extinguished freedom in Hong Kong. On the contrary, China, Russia, and Cuba were just elected as members of the Human Rights Council. We are entitled to ask, is this the universality objectivity, non-selectivity, and elimination of double standards that was promised in the Council's founding resolution? Let's look at the reports. In this session, the Council will hear and debate one report on Sri Lanka, one on Myanmar, one on Nicaragua, and four on Israel. That's more than on any other country. Meanwhile, in this session of the UNHRC, there are zero reports on Somalia, where 95% of girls aged 4 to 11, face genital mutilation. Zero reports on Pakistan, which persecutes Hindus, Christians, Sikhs, Shias, and Ahmadis, and hosts terrorist groups. And zero reports on Mauritania, which, according to CNN and The Guardian, is the world's last bastion of actual slavery, with 500,000 black slaves. On the contrary, all of these countries are members of this Human Rights Council. Again, we are entitled to ask, is this the promised universality, objectivity, non-selectivity, and elimination of double standards? Finally, let's take a look at the resolutions. In this session, there will be one on North Korea, one on Syria, one on Sri Lanka, and then again, four on Israel. Now, what's wrong here is not just the numbers, but the content of the resolutions. The texts condemn Israel for defending its citizens from terrorist rockets, stabbings, and car ramming attacks. These resolutions, which are designed to fuel the prosecution of Israelis in the International Criminal Court, incentivize the terrorists, Hamas and Islamic Jihad, to continue targeting civilians. Meanwhile, in this session, there will be zero resolutions on Saudi Arabia, which subjugates women and imprisons 
pro-democracy activists like Raif Badawi, zero resolutions on Turkey, which purged thousands of academics, journalists, and judges, and tramples its Kurdish population, and zero on Venezuela, where brutal oppression and state collapse have caused five million people to flee. Ladies and gentlemen, on the 15th anniversary of the reformed Human Rights Council, and 75 years after the founding of the United Nations, we are entitled to ask, where is the promised universality, objectivity, and elimination of double standards? Where is the UN Charter's guarantee of equal treatment for all nations, large and small? It's time to say enough is enough. It's time to fight back for the UN's founding principles, which are noble. That is what we're doing at UN Watch today with the launch of our new database, which will empower all of you to get the information you need to advocate for change in your own country, to make sure your government is voting the right way. And that is what our distinguished keynote speaker is doing every day in his role as ambassador to the United Nations. Before being posted to New York and Washington, Ambassador Erdogan was a member of Knesset from 2003 to 2020 and held key positions in the government. As Minister of Environmental Protection between 2009 and 2013, he led a precedent-setting government decision on Israel's commitment to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and prepared a strategy for green growth in Israel. From 2013 to 2014, he served as Minister of Communications, where he increased competition in all sectors of the industry and reformed Israel's National Broadcasting Authority. From 10, 2015 to 2020, Ambassador Erdogan was Minister of Public, Public Security, where he ensured the security of Israeli citizens during a period of heightened terrorist attacks. His innovative approach included preempting attacks with advanced technologies used to identify terrorists ahead of time. From 2015 to 2020, Ambassador Erdogan also served as Minister of Strategic Affairs, where he coordinated the government's strategy against the Palestinian-led efforts to delegitimize and boycott the State of Israel. Ambassador, that position, I am sure, prepared you very well for what you face every day at the UN General Assembly and other UN bodies. Ladies and gentlemen, Ambassador Gilad Erdan. Thank you, Hillel, for that warm introduction and for everything you do for the State of Israel and the Jewish people. Under your leadership, UN Watch has become a leading voice in defending Israel in the international arena. We all owe you a great deal of gratitude for your dedication to truth and justice. Friends, the new UN Watch database is an incredible resource, not only for those who are already committed to fighting the bias against Israel at the UN, but for sharing the truth with those who are not aware of it yet. Unfortunately, too many people, organizations, and countries are so rooted in their anti-Semitic positions that they are unable to even consider objective evidence and acknowledge the shortcomings of the UN and its bias against Israel. But the facts speak for themselves. The Human Rights Council, with a stunning 60% of its members not being democracies, has a special agenda item, agenda item seven, designed for the world's only Jewish state. We have also been the subject of more special sessions at the Human Rights Council that, than any other country and have more resolutions adopted against us than any other country, including Syria, Iran, and North Korea. Many Israel-related resolutions at the UN include harsh and inflammatory language not included when discussing other countries. For example, Israel is labeled an occupying power, a term that is not used in any other conflict. Such resolutions, including the so-called Palestinian package of anti-Israel resolutions, are passed using the automatic anti-Israel majority. This majority is a result of the voting dynamic at the UN in which countries vote according to their blocks. This absurd system has created a reality in which countries support resolutions because that is the way their bloc is voting, not because of their content. Just to highlight the insanity, while the General Assembly and Security Council passed hundreds of resolutions condemning Israel, 
We are all still waiting to see even one resolution condemning Hamas or Hezbollah. These and the numerous other examples of the UN's moral failings and transformation into a shameful politically motivated body have made many people skeptical about the institution's motives and its ability to facilitate real change. While the skepticism is warranted and even crucial, the cynicism is dangerous. Ben-Gurion famously dismissed the UN as um shmum. Over the years, it has grown even more deserving of this disdain. Yet, we must not discount its power. The fact that some countries still submit themselves to the UN's leadership means that the institution can have a real impact on Israel. Often, the anti-Israel sentiment of UN resolutions and statements is taken at face value. In some countries, they find their way into national discourses and even legislation, many times with the aid of those who attempt to boycott and delegitimize Israel. They use the UN's lies and one-sided language as a cloak of legitimacy to hide their anti-Semitic ambitions while continuing to fan the flames of hate. A recent example of how a UN General Assembly resolution can have a major effect on Israel is the morally bankrupt and distorted decision by the outgoing ICC prosecutor to launch an investigation against Israel. Her decision was enabled by the ICC pretrial chamber which asserted that it has jurisdiction over issues in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. To reach that outrageous conclusion, the majority opinion relied on the disgraceful United Nations General Assembly Resolution of 2012, which has come to be known as rendering the Palestinians a so-called non-member state at the UN. They claimed that this political and non-binding General Assembly resolution passed with the automatic majority against Israel was sufficient to establish jurisdiction for the purposes of the court. The court's outrageous decision speaks volumes about the politicization and anti-Semitism that has commandeered the ICC but it is also a cautionary tale of what UN resolutions can result in. We at Israel's mission to the United Nations fight against anti-Israel bias every day. And while we have seen a lot of success, when I sit in Security Council meetings and hear member states repeat the lies fed to them by the Palestinians or see countries continue to blindly vote for their despicable resolutions, I'm reminded that we still have a lot more work to do. We are glad to have Hillel and UN Watch by our side, but we need your help as well. We cannot allow the anti-Israel lies spewed at the UN to go unchallenged. They must be called out wherever and whenever we hear them. The new UN Watch database is a great resource to learn more and take action. It is a phenomenal tool that can have a real impact. Friends, peace is spreading in the Middle East and the anti-Israel consensus in the region is crumbling. I believe that the effects of the Abraham Accords will soon be felt at this institution as well. That the new voices emerging from within the Arab world accepting and embracing Israel will grow louder and turn into votes for truth and peace at the UN. Until that day, we will draw upon the invaluable work of UN Watch and of course on your dedication to the State of Israel. While this is not an easy battle, it is an important one 
and with your help, we are making real progress. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, Ambassador Erdogan, for your powerful remarks and for your kind words. We wish you every success in your mission, and you and Watch will continue to be here as a partner in combating anti-Israeli bigotry at the UN. I would now like to invite my colleague, our legal advisor, Dina Rovner, who put in tremendous work over three years to oversee this project to officially launch the UN Watch database. Thank you, Hillel. It is my great pleasure today to launch the UN Watch database, which I believe represents a major contribution to the cause of UN reform and of combating dictatorships, double standards, and discrimination at the United Nations. Before we show key features of this vital research and advocacy tool, I would like to say a few words about its origin and purpose. As we just heard from Ambassador Erdan and from Hillel, the United Nations is failing to live up to its founding principles. Instead of acting to promote international peace and security and to protect fundamental human rights worldwide, the UN routinely elects dictatorships to key positions and turns a blind eye to the worst abusers of human rights. Repressive regimes use their influence to shield themselves and their allies from any scrutiny. Instead, numerous UN bodies obsessively target Israel, the world's only Jewish state and the only democracy in the Middle East, with a grossly disproportionate amount of one-sided condemnations adopted year after year. At the General Assembly in 2020, for example, there was one resolution on Iran, one on Syria, and one on North Korea, and 17 on Israel. This corruption of the UN's founding principles and ideals ought to be a matter of grave concern for all who value democracy, fundamental freedoms, and the rule of law. Regrettably, however, most Western democracies are actually enablers of this moral corruption at the United Nations, simply going along to get along. Instead of using their power to challenge and reform the system, countries like the United Kingdom, France, Germany, and the Netherlands vote for more than 70% of UNGA resolutions that target Israel. Fortunately, though, not everyone is willing to accept this as normal. Over the years, people around the world who want to fight UN bias would write to us at UN Watch to ask for statistics about UN resolutions or about the composition of certain UN bodies. Often, they needed the data for help in publishing an article, writing a letter to the editor, or contacting their elected representatives. Likewise, speechwriters for members of Congress, senators, even prime ministers would call us to request the latest information. Because new UN resolutions are constantly being adopted, and because countries rotate often on UN bodies, this information has to be constantly updated, and people ultimately want more. They want to see the texts that were adopted, to understand the context, and to know how their country voted. And so, we at UN Watch realized that the world needed a user-friendly website to easily access all of that information, and we decided to build it. I am delighted that now, for the first time, UN Watch's new database provides lawmakers, journalists, researchers, and activists with the essential information and tools they need to identify UN discrimination and double standards. Moreover, the database empowers citizens worldwide to demand change with ready-made petitions for every country. We prepared the following short video to show you key features of the database. Please take a look. The United Nations is mandated by its founding principles to speak out for victims of human rights violations and to hold their oppressors to account. Sadly, however, millions of human rights victims around the world are routinely ignored by the UN. Instead of condemning the abusers, all too often, the UN awards brutal dictatorships with positions of honor. The UN Watch database provides essential and constantly updated data and analysis on how dictatorships dominate UN human rights bodies, how each country votes, and how UN resolutions single out Israel for discriminatory treatment. The website provides three main features. One, dictatorships on UN bodies. This section lists all members of UN bodies that deal with human rights, highlighting the dictatorships. Two, key data on countries. This provides a page with information on each UN member state, including the country's 
human rights rating, its membership on UN bodies, and the list of any UN actions taken against that country. The page highlights each country's voting record on Israel and allows you to take action by petitioning your government to stop supporting biased resolutions. You can also compare how two different countries voted on Israel at the UN General Assembly. Three, database of UN country resolutions. This features resolutions on countries adopted by the General Assembly, the Human Rights Council, and other UN bodies. Resolutions can be sorted by various filters, such as country concerned, that's the country spotlighted in the resolution. Main sponsor, the country or group of countries which submitted the text. And you can distinguish between resolutions that actually condemn countries and those that don't. Whether you're a diplomat, journalist, researcher, activist, or just an ordinary citizen, the UN Watch database is the most informative and effective tool for monitoring the United Nations and holding it accountable to its charter. It's time to demand an end to the hijacking of UN bodies by the world's worst dictatorships. Find out how your country votes and take a stand for the UN's founding principles of universality, equality, and human rights. Now is the time for a Q&A as we're joined by journalists and friends of UN Watch from around the world who have shared with us their questions and comments by video. Let's start by giving the floor to the co-author of the excellent book, the War of Return, which makes the powerful case of how UNRWA, the UN agency that is supposed to help Palestinians, actually perpetuates the conflict. Dr. Anat Wilf. Congratulations, UN Watch, on your amazing database. I noticed in going through your database that you addressed the question of tone. That is, not just the insane number of resolutions that are pressed against Israel, but you looked at the question of tone, which is something that always struck me when I first learned about it, that not only is there an insane amount of resolutions against Israel in UN bodies, but that the tone of these resolutions, unlike resolutions against other countries, is always dark and bleak and was nothing redeeming to say about Israeli efforts. So I wanted to know how you and your methodology address the question of tone. How are you able to discern the tone of the anti-Israel resolutions compared with other resolutions? What are the elements that made you track certain resolutions as having a darker tone, a bleaker tone than others? I'd be very interested in that. Thank you. Those are very important points. Let me say a word about the tone of resolutions and more generally about the importance of our methodology in terms of which resolutions really matter. Indeed, UN resolutions on Israel stand out, not only in terms of the extreme numbers, but also in the particular language used. On our database homepage, towards the bottom, you can see a section comparing the tone of resolutions. <clears throat> when it comes to resolutions on other countries, even on dictatorships like North Korea, Belarus, or Eritrea, often the UN will include diplomatic language of praise, encouragement, or acknowledgement of positive steps. By contrast, when it comes to Israel, the texts are typically full of strong condemnations with never a single word of praise or any recognition whatsoever of something positive. Our analysis looks at what kind of language is used, along with multiple other factors, to determine whether a resolution counts as the condemnation of a country or not. You may ask why it, why it matters. Well. It matters quite a bit. When journalists asked the UN for statistics about how many country resolutions were adopted by the Human Rights Council, they misleadingly inflate the numbers in order to make the council seem fair, balanced, and universal, and in order to downplay the bias against Israel. In 2017, a UN spokesperson said the Human Rights Council had adopted 149 resolutions in the previous year. He was counting resolutions that don't deal with countries, or those that are part of a mandatory review that all countries undertake, but which have nothing to do with condemnations. In fact, many of those texts adopt reports that are full of praise for dictatorships. The UN Watch database, however, counts the resolutions that matter, the condemnations, the ones designed to name and shame. Instead of the UN's inflated figure of 149, our methodology shows clearly that there were only 17 resolutions adopted that year which actually condemned countries. 
Our examination of each resolution looks at whether the text criticizes or praises the government, whether it creates a mechanism to investigate the country concerned, and whether it was adopted under an agenda item dealing with violations or rather with mere technical assistance. The UN statistics do none of these things. Their inflated count includes a 2009 resolution that praised Sri Lanka for, quote, promotion and protection of all human rights, right after they had slaughtered 40,000 Tamils. They also count a 2010 resolution that likewise praised Sudan, despite atrocities in Darfur for its, quote, promotion and protection of human rights. The UN equates these resolutions that praise countries with resolutions that don't. The outcome allows them to minimize the discrimination against Israel. Under one version of their count, the Human Rights Council condemned Israel in 9% of its resolutions last year. Our database demonstrates that, in fact, the number is 26%, nearly three times as much. Likewise, when the HRC in September adopted two conflicting resolutions on Venezuela, the UN counts them as the same. But our analysis points out what matters, that one text was designed to truly hold the Maduro regime to account, while the other was sponsored by Iran, praised the Maduro regime, and was supported by Venezuela itself. The same goes for conflicting resolutions that have been adopted on Yemen and Burundi. If the country that is being addressed supports the text, that's usually a good sign that the resolution is not a condemnation. Our careful analysis pierces through the veil to explain what's really going on in each resolution and how we assess each text. Thank you, Dina. Now let's go to Arsen Ostrovsky, a human rights lawyer who is a longtime partner in our struggle at the UN. He's the CEO and chair of the International Legal Forum. Hi, my name is Arsen Ostrovsky, and I'm the CEO of the International Legal Forum. I'm standing here in Tel Aviv, in the historic house of David Ben-Gurion, Israel's first prime minister. David Ben-Gurion famously once dismissed the UN by saying, um, shmum. But the fact of the matter is what happens at the UN, it matters. To that extent, I wanted to applaud you and watch on the release of this database of yours, which is truly an indispensable tool in determining whether the United Nations is indeed living up to its own founding principles. One of the things I noticed on this database was the fact that the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Council countries, have supported, endorsed, and put forward a number of resolutions against the State of Israel at the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva. However, not one resolution in support of the persecution of Muslim communities around the world. Not one resolution about the Uyghur Muslim community in China or the persecution of Muslims in Africa and Asia and elsewhere. Why is that? Why is there that double standard? Arsen, what you are pointing to is a classic example of the cynicism that pervades the UN as a whole and especially the Human Rights Council. As you said, the 57-member Islamic group of countries initiates endless resolutions, urgent sessions, and commissions of inquiry against Israel. Now, supposedly, it's because they care about their fellow Muslims and for human rights. Yet for the Uyghur Muslims of China, who are being herded into camps, whose religious practice is banned, their culture destroyed, these Islamic countries do absolutely nothing. Actually, it's much worse. In the summer of 2019, for an example, an official letter was submitted by 50 ambassadors at the UN Human Rights Council that praised China's treatment of the Uyghurs. Astonishingly, numerous Muslim states were among the signatories, including Iran, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Syria, Algeria, Egypt, Somalia, and the state of Palestine. By the way, for those on American campuses who believe in intersectionality and who think that the Palestinian Authority is progressive, think again. Now, one more time. China herded one million Uyghur Muslims into camps, forbade Uyghurs, men, from growing beards, and the Muslim countries, including the Palestinians, praised China. So what's happening at the UNHRC is really the height of cynicism, and I think it exposes how many UN resolutions, especially those sponsored by dictatorships, are much more about a political agenda than about anything else. Now, uh, let's go to Ben Cohen. He's a journalist with the Algemeiner and a writer and thinker who has been a leading fighter against the demonization of Israel. Greetings to the UN Watch panel. I'm Ben Cohen and I'm a journalist uh, in New York. My question to you is this. 
The mid-1970s is a time when the United Nations General Assembly decides that Zionism is a form of racism, and it creates this uh, division for Palestinian rights, this entire infrastructure within the UN that engages in Palestinian propaganda. Uh, four decades on, it's still there. Why? Ben, you mentioned the infrastructure of anti-Israeli propaganda. You're quite right. Let me spell it out a little bit. The UN has a 25-nation Committee on the Exercise of the Inalienable Rights of the Palestinian People. This is the only human rights committee of the General Assembly that is devoted to a single cause. Its reports turn a blind eye to Palestinian terrorism against Israeli civilians. Its mandate concerns only Israeli actions, and it is inherently prejudiced and one-sided. Now, the UN Secretariat that does the work for this committee is called the Division for Palestinian Rights. It has a 15-member staff at UN headquarters dedicated to spreading anti-Israel propaganda at conferences held around the globe. The UN's Palestinian division is grossly disproportionate to the organization's other four staff divisions, which cover enormous geographical regions. Instead of seeking bridges for peace, the UN's Palestinian committee and its division seek to coordinate international boycotts against Israel. Any NGO, like UN Watch, that declines to sign a declaration of loyalty to their agenda is banned from participation in their meetings and events. Now, as documented, as documented on our database, the UN's anti-Israel infrastructure includes much more. There are some 20 resolutions every year at the UN General Assembly. The Human Rights Council agenda item singles out Israel, one-sided resolutions, commissions of inquiry, a special rapporteur on Palestine who investigates Israel only, not Hamas, then you have the World Health Organization. An annual resolution is adopted every year at the WHO condemning Israel alone on health rights. And you have similar bias at UNESCO and other UN bodies. Now, you asked why. Now, the resolutions are introduced by the Palestinians with the Arab and Islamic groups. But why do so many countries support it? Well, let's take a look. First, there's vote trading. There are 56 Islamic states and only one Jewish state. That's 56 to 1. Then, I mean, that's a major factor at the UN, vote trading. Then you have money. There are billions of dollars in sovereign wealth funds that the Islamic states have, and they will either invest it in your country or not, depending on how you vote at the UN. So we talked about vote trading, money, then there's oil. Vast reserves of oil in the Arab world historically was used as a weapon to pressure countries to vote for them at the UN. If you don't vote for us, you don't get oil. Finally, I'll mention two other factors, fear of terrorism, Countries were afraid that if they were some of the few countries not to vote for UN resolutions against Israel, they might be targeted by terrorists. And all of these factors are realpolitik, you may not like it, but vote trading, money, oil, fear of terrorism, that is practical interest and reality. And you can understand how countries may vote that way, but I'd say there's another factor. When countries vote against Israel, I don't see all of them being forced to do so because of these uh, pragmatic interests. Some of them seem rather content to single out Israel. And I have to say that when we think of the Middle Ages, when there was the plague, it was the Jews who poisoned the wells. And today, when we have human rights abuses around the world, and Israel is pointed, is the one that's pointed to as the arch human rights violator, it seems that Israel is treated as the Jew among the nations, which we would call the new form of anti-Semitism. I think that's another factor that we cannot dismiss. Um, let's take our next question, which is from a friend of UN Watch who was with us in Geneva back at the Durban II World Racism Conference in 2009. He was there to fight Ahmadinejad and the other racists. Let's give the floor to Professor Giltroy. This is Professor Giltroy. What's so depressing about this extraordinary new database by UN Watch is that it proves what Daniel Patrick Moynihan the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. 45 years ago said was true. He warned that this obsession with Israel would derail the cause of human rights and would undermine the credibility of the United Nations and the international community. And indeed, we see that. But this website does something else which is really important. It focuses, as Daniel Patrick Moynihan said, on the accusers, not the accused. It doesn't say what's wrong with Israel. It says what's wrong with them. Why are they so obsessed with finger pointing against Israel, against the world's one Jewish state, which is also a democracy? How do we change that? How do we improve the situation? 
Gil, thank you for mentioning Moynihan. In the history of the United Nations, there were two ambassadors who are worth reading and listening to for their eloquence, their brilliance, and their wit. One is Abba Iban, Israel's first UN ambassador and foreign minister. The second is Daniel Patrick Moynihan. His book, A Dangerous Place, is a brilliant memoir and was formative on my own thinking when I first arrived in Geneva at the UN. Moynihan captured intellectually what was happening at the United Nations. And Gil, you wrote a terrific book, Moynihan's Moment, which told the dramatic story of Moynihan's stand at the infamous 1975 resolution when it was adopted, Zionism is racism. Now, you asked, how do we change the finger pointing against Israel? It's not easy. I think there are a few things that we can do. First, people need to urge their governments to do the right thing. And our database will help with that, with information and petitions. You can go in our database, get the information you need, and urge your country to vote the right way. The other second factor I would mention is that Israel needs to make a priority in its own relations with other states that the UN bias is something that's at the top of their agenda. They need to pressure countries to change their votes at the UN. If Israel doesn't raise it in their foreign relations with other countries, then we can't expect any change to happen. Finally, I want to say that we have seen some change. In the past couple of years, we saw a number of countries change their votes on actually the, the resolutions that I mentioned before, the Palestinian Committee, the Palestinian Division. We had the Czech Republic, Germany, Switzerland, and several other countries change their votes to vote no, opposing that, that, um, those resolutions. And so it gives us some hope that if we take action, if we get the information, urge our countries to do the right thing, some countries are beginning to change their votes. We need to do so much more. Now, uh, let's go to another question. We have member of Knesset, Michal kotler Vunch who has been a great supporter of our work. Let's hear from Michal. Hi, my name is Michal kotler Wunsch, member of Knesset in Israel's parliament. Uh, we hosted uh, UN Watch and their database in the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee not long ago, and we were privy to information um, that actually exposes the use and abuse of international law and its institutions, including the Human Rights Council. And I'm wondering how it is that the Countries that are actually committing gross human rights violations, China, Cuba, Russia, are the very members of the Human Rights Council as we speak. Why do countries like China, Cuba, and Russia get elected? That's a very good question. Every year, the UN General Assembly holds elections for the Human Rights Council, and they're supposed to choose the candidates based on objective criteria, basically, if the countries support human rights. Indeed, Members of the Human Rights Council are obliged to uphold the highest standards of human rights. So those are the official criteria. The reality, however, is very different. The UN General Assembly chooses countries, chooses their candidates based on political considerations. They keep choosing countries like Venezuela, Libya, Somalia, Eritrea, Pakistan, and the list goes on, out of political considerations. And frankly, we keep asking democracies like the European Union to speak out and oppose the election of China, Cuba, and Russia, and the others. And they don't do a thing. They don't say a thing. So frankly, I think if this continues and these dictatorships keep getting elected and keep getting the false badge of international legitimacy, we may as well scrap elections altogether, let every country be a member of the council. That's how it is in the General Assembly. It doesn't allow any country to say, hey, I'm a member of the General Assembly. No, everyone's automatically a member. So if we're not going to enforce the criteria of the Human Rights Council, I think, frankly, we should consider scrapping the elections altogether and just letting every country be there so none will have the false badge of international legitimacy. All right, now let's go to our next question. We're going to hear from Lahav Harkov at the Jerusalem Post. Hi, I'm Lahav Harkov from the Jerusalem Post. I saw in the UN Watch database that some democracies like the UK and Germany have voted against Israel more than 70% of the time at the UN General Assembly. And since these countries all claim to support the UN Charter to treat all countries equally, and since these are countries that are supposedly allies of Israel, when you speak to their officials, how do they justify the way that they vote? Thank you, Lahav. You know, countries, uh, European countries, speak of international law. Uh, and they say, when I ask them, why do they support so many resolutions against Israel? They tell me, well, you know, international law. But the reality is they don't introduce any resolutions on Hamas, which violates international law. And there are many other countries, like Saudi Arabia, Turkey, China, that violate international law. And the European countries don't do a single thing. So the notion that 
they care about international law and that's what governs their decisions is questionable. Next, they say occupation. I will often hear from European countries that they vote against Israel because of occupation. And I'll ask them, well, uh, have you ever introduced a resolution on Turkey and its occupation of northern Cyprus? Uh, have you ever introduced a resolution on Russia for its occupation of Crimea? And the list goes on. And in many cases, they don't do a thing. So I think their excuses are rather empty. Uh, now let's go to Benny Avni. He's a longtime UN correspondent and a columnist with the New York Post. The Human Rights Council was established because its predecessor, even according to then Secretary General Kofi Annan, uh, dealt less with human rights and more with politics. It had a lot of uh, members who were uh, violators of human rights, actually, and dealt too much with members like the United States and Israel. I would like to see a compilation of how is the human rights better than the Commission of Human Rights, its predecessor? Is it different? And in what ways has it become better or in, as I believe, worse. Thank you. Benny, uh, you ask about the Human Rights Council, if it's any better than the Human Rights Commission, the old one. I would say that there was one innovation that the Human Rights Council has. It's called the Universal Periodic Review, which in theory is a good idea. In theory, every country gets reviewed one day every five years. Didn't happen in the old Human Rights Commission. Uh, so in theory, that's a good thing. In practice, it's only once every five years and the reviews are mostly mutual praise. So when China gets reviewed, Saudi Arabia is praising China. When Saudi Arabia gets reviewed, it's China praising Saudi Arabia. So yes, there is this UPR, but the reality is that it's largely a mutual praise society. If you go beyond that, the Human Rights Council, the membership continues to be awful, continue to have China, Cuba, Russia, Pakistan, the others that I mentioned, hasn't changed at all. And if we look at the worst abusers of human rights, there are a few resolutions on the worst abusers. There's a resolution on Syria, North Korea, but the vast majority of the world's worst abusers, whether it's China, Russia, Cuba, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, continue to get a free pass. I don't think the Human Rights Council is better than the Human Rights Commission. Now let's hear from uh, two longtime friends of UN Watch, partners in our battle for justice and human rights at the UN, Gerald Steinberg, the head of NGO Monitor, and Lord Stuart Polak from London. UN Watch's new database holds a mirror up to the face of the hypocrisy that characterizes the United Nations. It is an indispensable source of information for diplomats, journalists, academics, and the general public. The database will be a vital tool for holding officials from democratic governments to account when they support yet another anti-Israeli resolution or vote to elect the world's worst dictatorships to the Human Rights Council. I welcome the creation of the UN watch database, just as I welcome and appreciate the outstanding work carried out by uh, Hillel Neuer. When UN agencies single out Israel for condemnation, it is Hillel who stands up for the truth and reminds us all of why the UN was formed in the first place. The database will be a brilliant tool and resource to enable those who, like Hillel, want the truth to be told, to have the facts at their fingertips. Thank you, Hillel. We hope you will join us in fighting dictatorships, double standards, and discrimination at the UN. Our new database gives you the information and the tools. Please go online to unwatch.org database and sign the petition to urge your country to do the right thing. Before we conclude, I want to give a special thanks to UN Watch Chief of Staff Eileen Ergil Amsalem for producing today's program. I want to thank you all for joining us today and to thank you all for your support. <laughs>